You've probably opened the manual for a commercial transceiver, looked at the block diagram and closed it up again. All those boxes and wires joining them, it was hard to know where to start. A bit like trying to understand a Smith chart. It may come as a surprise then that you don't need to know too many different types of stages to be able to piece together a workable transmitter, receiver or transceiver. In this video I'll explain the main types of stages you need to know about. I'll go through each of the key stages and what they'll do and show you some examples of them. And in part two I'll talk about how you arrange stages to produce different types of receivers, transmitters and transceivers. One thing about that block diagram that you might not have realised is a lot of the stages do pretty much the same thing. Some of the variations between them might only be due to signal level or operating frequency. The stages come in a small number of families. If you understand that small number of families, then you can easily build them, put them together, rearrange them and come up with a variety of transmitter, transceiver and receiver projects. The first stage we have here are oscillators. There's both radio and audio oscillators, though we don't use audio oscillators very much in radio frequency circuitry. RF oscillators, their purpose is to generate a signal, either fixed frequency or variable frequency. The simplest oscillators are intended for fixed frequency and may have just a crystal, one transistor and a handful of other parts. You can get frequency agility if you substitute a variable capacitor and an inductance. However, that may offer less stability. And that's where the more modern types of oscillators, like direct digital synthesizers, come into their own. But for now, just think of an oscillator as a circuit that produces a low level radio frequency signal. It may be variable or it may be fixed. Here's an example radio frequency oscillator. It's a crystal oscillator, actually using two crystals, because this one you can vary its frequency slightly and it's two transistors one is actually the oscillator and the other is a buffer amplifier there's not too many other components other varieties include using a coil and a variable capacitor to achieve a wider range than is possible with the crystals next stage are amplifiers there's radio and audio frequency amplifiers audio frequency amplifiers for our use are used in microphone amplifiers and also in the, just before the speaker in your receiver. Our first amplifier type is a simple one transistor audio amplifier not using many parts at all. As you can see on the back it's intended as a microphone amplifier for use in a transmitter to amplify low level signals from a microphone to a level suitable for use in later stages of the transmitter. Another audio amplifier here has two transistors in a high gain arrangement. It's intended for use in a direct conversion receiver where it provides the only gain in the receiver. It is connected between the mixer or product detector and the operator's headphones. What we've got here is an audio amplifier using an eight-legged IC, the popular LM386. It's the last stage in a receiver and will directly drive a speaker radio frequency amplifiers. Their purpose is to boost the feeble signal from the radio frequency oscillator and make it a bit stronger. It's probably still not strong enough to be heard so we get another stage, a radio frequency power amplifier stage. You can have as many of these circuits as you like and increase the power from a few milliwatts generated by the oscillator to many megawatts such as with international broadcast stations and other purposes. Not too many parts, but notice the large heatsink. That's a dead giveaway that it's a power amplifier. In this case, it's an RF power amplifier and is suitable for the final stage of a transmitter. It will probably put out 1 to 2 watts. The next of our basic building blocks is the mixer. A mixer has two inputs and one output. You need signals coming in through both inputs for it to work. It takes the sum, or the difference, of the input frequencies. So there are actually two signals coming out of the mixer. For instance, if you had a 2 and a 7 MHz signal going into the mixer, one of the outputs will be the sum of those frequencies. 2 plus 7 is 9 MHz. 
the other output from the mixer will be the difference between the two signals. 7 minus 2 is 5 megahertz. Here we have a mixer using two broadband ferrite coils. The other components you can just see in the middle are four diodes. A similar configuration, strangely enough, can work as a frequency doubler as well. Another variety of mixer is this balance modulator. It's a similar arrangement with four diodes, but in this case there's only one ferrite. There's a potentiometer here to balance the mixer and to null out unwanted signals, as that is very important in this particular application. Normally only one of the signals coming out of the mixer is desirable and the other needs to be cut out. That's where our next stage can help. Radio frequency filters. There's three main types. There's band pass, which admits only frequencies in a narrow range. There's low pass, which admits frequencies only below a certain frequency. And there's high pass, which lets signals through only if they're above a certain frequency. All are useful in radio frequency work. In all cases, RF filters contain inductors and capacitors. There's no other parts in them needed. Depending on how they are connected, they'll behave as either a band pass, high pass or low pass filter. Our first has three capacitors and two inductors. Each of the capacitor has one leg earthed. In this configuration, it's a low pass filter and would be used on the output of a transmitter to suppress harmonics. Now here's another filter containing a pair of tuned circuits. There's an inductor and a capacitor. As you can see, it's a trimmer, so it's variable, and it can be tuned to be spot-on frequency. In between the two tuned circuits is this twisted wire. That's actually a low-value capacitor. Capacitance being formed when two parallel wires are held together or twisted. There's enough coupling between them to provide a very selective path for signals that are spot-on frequency. A circuit like this would be great for a front end of a receiver or after a mixer in a transmitter. Our final filter has no coils at all. It's just crystals. It's actually a very sharp and very narrow filter. In this case with a bandwidth of 2 or 3 kilohertz. A crystal filter like this would be suitable in an SSB transmitter or receiver. And note you've also got some stages attached to them. These are actually RF amplifier stages intended to provide a boost to the signal both before and after the crystal filter. And there's another stage that's not used as much now and that's a frequency multiplier. You team a frequency multiplier with an oscillator and as its name suggests you get multiples of the frequency that you're injecting into it. For instance a 7 MHz oscillator attach a frequency multiplier let's say it's a doubler stage and you get 14 MHz coming out. Because a lot of the amateur bands are multiples, 3.5, 7, 14, 21 megahertz, etc., that method was used in the old days to obtain several bands from the one crystal or variable frequency oscillator. Multipliers aren't so much used now with more modern frequency synthesizers. Just to recap, there's only a few different types of stages that you need to know about. Oscillators, amplifiers, mixers, and filters. Within each family though there are some variations mainly depending on the operating frequency and the signal level involved. Join me in part two where I'll put these stages to work in a variety of transmitter, receiver and transceiver configurations.